hello everyone and most welcome to Timbro this summer lunch. Uh, my name is Malin Salian and I am responsible at Timbro for our work on economic issues. Today's seminar though is more about Chinese subsidies to solar panel industries and other industries and uh, EU tariffs to the same. And it's, mar it's market and uh, environmental consequences. Uh, as the subject is of both economic and environmental interest, uh, I will be, I'm cooperating about it with my colleague, Lydia Wolstein, uh, who, are, who is the project leader on those issues. Uh, so again, most welcome here. And um, by this, I uh, leave the floor to Pernilla Ström, who's gonna lead the talk. Thank you so much, Marlin. Um, the ladies and gentlemen, once again, welcome to this seminar where we're going to discuss the shady side of solar energy, trade war, and Chinese subsidies. And we are uh, going to focus on the content in this book. Uh, I don't know if you've, s uh, probably you've seen it, but I'm sure that you haven't read it yet, but you should you really ought to read it because it's terribly interesting. Um, and it's called Subsidies to Chinese Industry, State Capitalism, Business Strategy, and Trade Policy. Uh, and my name is Pernilla Ström, and I'm going to be the moderator for this seminar. So for the next one hour and a half, we will discuss issues uh, like subsidies, uh, trade war consequences, what could be done, what should the Chinese do, what should the European and Americans do, um, and what, uh, what, what else there can be said. Uh, we have seen, or many of us have believed that the Chinese, China's success depended on huge supply of cheap labor and on under undervalued currency, but uh, today we will learn that that is not so. Uh, behind the drastic shift from the net importer to the world's largest exporter in some sectors, uh, in like steel, glass, paper and others, uh, the explanation is subsidies, not comparative advantages. So we are going to discuss and focus on, uh, is there a problem? And for whom is there a problem? Should measures be taken? What kind of measures should then be taken? And what will be the long-term policy implications? We will start first with Iran, where we will listen to the authors of this interesting book. Uh, and then we will, um, they will speak for roughly half an hour. And I will take some questions from you in the audience directly if you want that. And then we'll have three prominent commentators who will give their comments on, on the book and the content of the books. And then we'll have a round of discussion and I will also invite you in the audience uh, to take part in that discussion. And we'll finish uh, here at 1.30 sharp. Uh, with that, I'm very proud to introduce to you our main speakers today. It's uh, Professor Usha Haley, who is the director of the Robbins Center for Global Business and Strategy at the West Virginia University. And it's also Professor George Haley, who is Professor of Marketing at the University of New Haven. Uh, Asha and George, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Timbro. Thank you, Lydia, Marlon, and others for inviting us. It's an honor to be here and to speak here. And to, I'm Usha, this is George. We wrote the book, and as Lydia pointed out, Usha does all the talking. Not so, <laughs> not so. But I, I will be talking a little bit about our, our, um, our project, and George will take all the hard questions later on. <laughs> so that's how we've split it. We're going to talk today, about, as, as was pointed out, about subsidies to Chinese industry, implications for trade policy and national competitive advantage. And it's on our book, Subsidies to Chinese Industry by Oxford University Press, which was published in April of this year. Over the last five years, we watched China move from net importer to largest manufacturer and largest exporter in capital intensive industries in which it enjoyed no comparative advantage just a few years prior. We saw industrialized countries become primarily exporters of scrap and commodities to China, and we've observed the effects on both business strategy and national competitive advantage. These changes took place over the last five years, and in our opinion, this, uh, this issue of subsidies is probably the the one of the most important game changers of the 21st century, but also the least researched and we will be talking about why. S our theories, our economic theories and subsidies have mostly concentrated on those in developed and industrialized countries. 
Economic theories have mostly portrayed subsidies, manufacturing subsidies especially, as distortive, redistributing and reallocating resources according to non-market criteria that result in economically inefficient allocation of these resources. So when they have looked at subsidies, the about, they have generally assumed that the subsidizing country is going to be detrimentally affected by these subsidies and that consumers around the world would benefit because of the cheaper goods that they get, subsidized goods from China. They have rarely seen issues, I mean, rarely addressed issues or, or done research on how subsidies can contribute to some aspects of a country's competitive advantage and not just disadvantage. But Chinese policy has historical precedent, not in these metaphors of free trade, but in Confucian metaphors, where individual utility subsumes in harmonious fashion to administrative utility. In China, the state capitalist regime, which is the central, the provincial, and the municipal governments, view ch subsidies as conceptions of control, important ways in which the central and the provincial governments produce and stabilize common understandings of markets. Subsidies are used by the governments to advance theirs and the Communist Party of China's political, social, economic, and diplomatic goals. And the government willingly pays the price of economic inefficiencies in order to achieve those goals. And that has not been studied, that aspect of it. So I'm going to begin by talking a little bit about capitalism with Chinese characteristics, then move on to talk about our data and problems, a little bit about subsidies to steel, glass, paper, and auto parts, hone in on the solar industry, which is such a topic of interest currently in the European Union, and then answer any and, and talk about some of the implications for policy and open it up to discussion. State capitalism refers to a situation where the state plays significant and visible roles in markets. And there are generally two dimensions to state capitalism. One is the extent of the state's ownership of, um, of instruments of production, and the second is the, ab the ability of the state to coordinate with other institutions and other enterprises. China uniquely synchronizes party, government, military, and economy. The state is almost seamlessly present in every aspect of the economy. The state freely creates and maintains enterprises. It holds a majority of shareholdings. It controls critical personnel decisions. And it supplies capital to the state-owned enterprises who are ultimately answerable to the state and not to their shareholders. Control of capital is extremely important in this system. The Chinese government creates and maintains all the banks. It directs all the financial institutions. And the state, uh, the, uh, the vice premier also controls all the major banks. Okay. So the banks are not independent in this system. Flows of capital are extremely important, but very poorly understood. Because there are very few industry studies that have looked at, especially longitudinally, how these flows of capital are allocated, who lends to whom, who borrows from whom. This is not, the data on these are not easily available. So though it's an important issue, it is poorly researched. China, of course, is not a homogeneous state. It's a multi-organizational state. Several semi-independent organizational sets, including those at the provincial levels and at the municipal levels, all which with their own goals, all with their own agendas. And sometimes these agendas and goals clash. And you can see this often in budgetary processes, when the states propose something and the center overrules or vice versa. <coughs> Excuse me. One avenue for, for subsidies is fixed asset investments. And that has been rising in China. Fixed asset investments as a percentage 
of GDP in China rose from 24% in 1990 to 66% in 2009. The power of the state in China is expanding. We found no evidence of a gradualist perspective where the state is retreating and private enterprises coming to the fore. Yes, private consumption in China is rising, but state consumption in China is rising at an even faster level. So the ratio of private to government consumption in China is falling. Now we looked at subsidies to several industries. We looked at subsidies to steel, glass, paper, auto parts, and the solar PV industry. All these were capital intensive industries. They were manufacturing industries as well, with labor between two and seven percent of the cost of production. So there was no labor advantage that China enjoyed here. And this two to seven percent of total cost is not just a global figure, but it's also the figure for China. These are fragmented industries with no economies of, of scale or scope. And they were geographically fragmented as well because every province wanted one of these industries. Yet, despite having no technological advantage either, prices were between 25 to 30 percent lower than the US or the EU. And that was the puzzle we set out to, to solve. We looked at subsidies that we could verify and that we could confirm from more than one source. There was plenty of anecdotal evidence there and plenty of stories. And if you talk to people in China, they will tell you all sorts of horror stories. Well, horror stories depending on where you're situated. But uh, you know about, for example, how um, pro provincial governments unhooked companies from the grid so that they didn't pay any electricity at all. But we couldn't confirm any of this. I mean, we, the, we, didn't, we couldn't, didn't have avenue to those kinds of data. We know that that exists. So all we looked at was free or low cost loans, subsidies to energy, including electricity, coal, both thermal and coking <coughs> coal, and natural gas, and subsidies to inputs, such as soda ash, pulp, recycled paper, glass, cold rolled steel, as well as subsidies to land and for technology, technology acquisition primarily. <coughs> well, our study has several problems. The major one is the institutional limitations of gathering these kinds of data on China in China. The Chinese do not accept that, have not at any point admitted that they subsidized their industry. <laughs> so for example, when they joined the WTO in 2001, they were supposed to give an annual report disclosing their subsidies. They have done so only once. They're supposed to have done this every year since they joined. That was incomplete because they only re revealed subsidies to foreign invested enterprises. They didn't reveal any subsidies to domestic companies, and they didn't reveal any subsidies from provinces. There are also a lack of rigorous industry surveys in China. And not, not all of this is nefarious. It's again, as I said, a part of the institutional fabric of China, that they don't conduct these kinds of rigorous industrial surveys. And there is opaque and contradictory accounting data in China. Many mundane accounting um, variables such as related party transactions are impossible to compute in China because of the overpowering presence of the state and the interconnected nature of state-owned enterprises. So that was, that's, those kinds of common indicators are not there. Therefore, we use data from various sources, private and public, across countries, including China. We use data, data from governments, companies, NGOs, investment houses, and industry associations, and we cross-checked our data. We did longitudinal studies, so we cross-checked our data, and when we couldn't confirm any data, we threw it out. Even in those days, we started this about five years ago, we knew this was going to be pretty controversial. <coughs> so it's pretty, you know, we, we, just, we just kept what we could verify. Pretty much what we are disclosing 
and what we're talking about is the tip of the iceberg. Let's talk about steel. Steel is a pillar industry in China, and foreign investment for all practical purposes is not allowed. In 2013, China is the largest producer and consumer of steel, with about 50% of production, about 16% in 1999. As you know, China joined the WTO in 2001. Since then, subsidies to Chinese steel increased. And overnight, the industry changed. In 2005, China went from net steel importer to steel exporter. In 2006, China became the largest exporter in the world. In 2007, China consolidated its position as the largest steel producer. Steel making capacity more than doubled between 2005 and 2012 and is continuing to grow. From 2000 to 2006, energy subsidies, and that's all we looked at in this study, subsidies to electricity, natural gas, and coal grew by 1,365%. Total energy subsidies from 2000 to mid-2007 were $27.11 billion. Now, I know I'm talking in, on a, in, a, in one of the bastions of uh, free market thinking in Europe, but you know that subsidies, when, when subsidies are present, there is no free market. Markets fail as they can no longer set prices. The center has called for the consolidation of the steel industry quite routinely. However, every province wants a steel industry, so the industry is also highly fragmented geographically. No economies of scale, no economies of scope. Here you see <coughs> excuse me, the rise in, this, in this, um, energy subsidies from about 2000 to 2007. We estimated that there were about 27.1 billion in total subsidies across all electricity, coal, and natural gas. Energy subsidies also correlated with exports, Chinese exports to the rest of the world, as well as Chinese production and exports to the United States. And what happened? <coughs> Massive excess capacity in China, with supply exceeding demand on average by 20% every year. Annually, though, more capacity is added in China then the total output of the second largest producer of steel in the world, Japan. From 2000 to 2012, the United States has had a trade deficit with China on steel for every year but one. In 2012, the U.S. trade deficit was 142% greater than in 2000. Despite all the factors that we talked about, no technological advantage, no economies of scale or scope, a capital-intensive industry, Chinese steel costs between 20 and 30 percent less than U.S. or EU steel. From 2009, the U.S. and EU have filed trade complaints and slapped tariffs against China. I now understand Mexico is doing the same. Let's look at glass. China is the largest producer and consumer of glass in the world. It has the largest number of glass enterprises, and since 2003, glass production has doubled, and production capacity has doubled and tripled since 2000. Now, if you look at the, this is just the, the subsidies that we could again calculate. They include energy, but also include other subsidies, including inputs, like soda ash. Again, the tip of the iceberg from 2000, when 2004, we, got, we calculated about a billion dollars in subsidies to 2008, about 16 billion for a total of about 30 billion in subsidies. We estimated that about 35% of the gross industrial output of glass was subsidies. <laughs> and the subsidies were about 35% and that they were rising. And I think part of the reason is that, the, that there's a saturation of capital. So every extra dollar of subsidy is getting a, less, a smaller and smaller return. Again, remember that we could just, this is just what we could measure. So there is more underlying there. Now let's look at the perennial trade disparity between the US and, the chi and China. 
U.S. imports from China have been rising at a much higher level than U.S. exports to China on glass. So although both have been rising, the, the trade disparity has been rising as well. Now let's look at paper. It's a really interesting industry. In 2008, China overtook the United States to become the largest paper producer in the world. In 2009, it produced 17% of world paper. Yet, 88% of these companies are small. China has no natural advantage in paper making. Indeed, China has among the smallest forestry bases per capita in the world. So it imports, at market prices, all its inputs. 35% of the cost of paper is pulp, and China imports the pulp. Labor is only about 4% of the cost, Chinese cost of producing paper, yet Chinese paper sells for 30% less than US or EU paper, despite all the imported in inputs. We calculated 33 billion in subsidies from 2002 to 2009. Huge excess capacity in this industry, yet about, on average, 26% more capacity is added annually. Here it is, the perennial trade gap <laughs> between the U.S. and China. <coughs> now, autos is a very interesting industry. And autos is an industry in which Chinese subsidies have actually had managed to create an advantage for Chinese auto producers. Autos is a pillar industry in China, both for the center and for 24 provinces, all of which, of course, is an auto industry. China, as you know, is the largest auto, auto market in the world. Yet auto parts make up 70% of the cost of an auto. China is now one of the largest auto parts producers in the world, with exports to the United States a third of production. Chinese policy in Auto Parts has focused on the acquisition and development of new energy and green technologies. Again, the industry is highly fragmented, 10,000 registered and at least 15,000 unregistered manufacturers. From 2001 to 2011, we calculated that about 28 billion in subsidies was given, with about 11 billion earmarked for restructuring and technology development over the next decade. The industry, <coughs> excuse me, has grown 150% since 2004. China is a net importer of auto parts from every automaker in the world except the United States, where it is a net exporter of auto parts. And that is because of U.S. policy. U.S. companies have structured their supply chains to where they manufacture in China and export to the rest of the world, and export to the United States. And here again, the <laughs> perennial trade deficit with the United States. We estimated that between 2000 and 2011, as I said, 28 billion in subsidies was given, with another 11 billion for restructuring and technological development for the next decade. Fixed investment has been rising in Chinese auto parts, but output value has been rising even faster, showing that these subsidies to Chinese auto parts have actually restructured the industry beneficially for the Chinese. They've allowed the Chinese manufacturers to move into more higher value-added uh, production. But there are issues, of course, there are technology transfer issues. In order to access the Chinese auto market, companies have been forced to give up their technology. And that is called the policy of indigenous innovation. So that has raised all kinds of other uh, issues worldwide. There have been trade issues with the United States on branding, how, the, how these how cars are branded, with the WTO on tariffs and new energy vehicles. And there have been provincial disputes because there is such an overcapacity in China that the provinces compete against each other and try to erect barriers of entry for one province into another. And they brand to do that. As well, as well as have local subsidy regulations that discriminate against other provinces. 
I want to end by just talking a little bit about the solar PV industry because that is so important currently and that's the, the debate has been going on. Currently, China is the undisputed leader in solar PV production. But as you may know, the United States actually invented the solar industry and invented the, the technology behind it. 80% of all solar production, PV panel production in, occurs in China. From, but to, in 2008, prior to 2008, it had no solar panel industry to speak of. Prices from 2008 to 2012 have fallen by 75%. But what are some of the implications of this, U.S. diversity versus Chinese manufacturing scale? As you may know, there is no free market for the solar industry. All companies, all countries either support production or they support consumption. So most of European countries, for example, support the consumption, subsidized consumption of solar. And Germany, for example, has a really finely tuned system for that, an FIT, feed-in tariff system. The United States has been pretty sloppy about it, you know, with um, supporting consumption here and there in some of the states and not in others. But in production, the United States has consistently supported technology development. It is a leader, undisputed leader in the world in supporting technology development and that aspect of production. So many of the technological breakthroughs have had their seeds in the U.S. subsidies that are, that are behind them. This technology differentiation has allowed for the development of innovative thin film PV technologies. The Chinese, on the other hand, with the scale of their production, back older technologies, wafer silicon technologies, which allow them to scale up, increase, uh, grant more wages to more people, and export more. Because of the scale of Chinese production, as I said, China now makes 80% of all solar panels, what it produces, it anoints as the standard technology. The old, clunky technology, 85% of what we, more than 85% is wafer silicon. The old technology that China has been made the dominant standard. When you look at the co Chinese comparative cost, of, do, how many more minutes do I have? Five, okay. Well. If you look at China's comparative cost advantage vis-a-vis -vis the United States, or, or there is none. As a matter of fact, on a level playing field, <coughs> it's less than 4%. If you start factoring in some of the cost advantages and subsidies, it goes up to about 18 to 20%. But then you factor in shipping costs, China actually has a 5% cost disadvantage. How then has to have Chinese solar panels <laughs> been, frankly, so cheap? Well, we started looking at these companies, and we found out that their debt and net cash balances were astounding, to say the least. So here are some of these Chinese companies compared to First Solar. And we did this study about a year or two ago. And this we found, of course, that LDK and SunTech had huge debt to finance their expansion. And what we said at that point in time was that without these subsidies, they would be bankrupt because that's what we found. And that has happened. SunTech, as you know, SunTech Wuxi declared bankruptcy earlier this year, uh, I think a couple of months ago. And it was bailed out by its province, Wuxi. LDK China is teetering on the brink. <coughs> and there will be more bankruptcies. Here is something on the capacity expansion of Chinese and US solar PV companies. There has been a tenfold expansion <laughs> from 2008. Contributing to a huge supply demand imbalance. As so, hap happens with, so often happens with China and these industries, you, things change even while you're talking about them. So when we, were, when we did the study about uh, last year or so, we estimated a supply demand imbalance almost all the supply coming from China, almost all the demand coming from the rest of the world, of about 45%. But then we rechecked our figures earlier this year and found out that they were out of date. Currently, estimated global demand is 30 gigawatts, and Chinese production is 60 gigawatts, so there is 100% overcapacity.
China may be the largest exporter in the world, but it is a laggard on installation. Despite high-profile high projects such as Golden Sun, China has less than 1% of all installed solar panels. Everything it produces, for the most part, is for export. Oh, here it is again. <laughs> Some of the interesting questions then are, how have these duties affected imports, <coughs> excuse me, employment or manufacturing in US solar? What are the lessons for EU solar? What incentivizes Chinese production and exports? How do EU and US policies affect Chinese provincial production, which really is what should be affected, because it's these provinces that are pushing the expansion? And how can globalized supply chains be addressed? Thank you very much. <coughs> Thank you so much, uh, Asha. Um, <coughs> there George, so you want to come up? He's going to yeah. answer all the tough questions. He's going to ask the questions, OK. Uh -huh. uh, no. The tough ones, I can answer. <laughs> there have been, there been um, as you said and as you mentioned, uh, the European Commission introduced uh, anti-dumping uh, duties on solar panels from China on the 4th of June. They will start with 11% and they might turn up much higher. Is this a good way? Is it the good way to do? Is it, is, is it a measure that should have been taken? Because that has created a strong, very fierce debate in Sweden and in Europe all over. I don't see what 11% and then going up to 49% is going to do. We're talking about 100% excess supply. And I, I think it's on the low side. <coughs> Even with those, as the, the panels are going to keep coming. <laughs> it's just there. But is it a bad thing that those cheap panels are coming? I mean, what's the problem if the Chinese are, are supporting <coughs> providing Europe and, and the rest of the world with cheap solar panels, helping us to fight the climate problems? You know, that's, there is a, one of my economics professors used to say, there, there ain't no such thing as a free lunch. You begin with <coughs> that in economics. George, you could answer that question. It's well, there, there's two, two reasons why it's a bad thing. One is uh, people talk about how much uh, the cost of, of solar generated power has gone down with the Chinese uh, production under their subsidy regime. But it would have gone down about 45, 50 percent anyway, even without any Chinese production. That's on average of what it had been going down, the price of solar pr uh, produced power had been going down in previous, uh, about the previous <coughs> decade. So it's not that, that prices wouldn't have gone down, they just wouldn't have gone down as much. The difference between uh, Going, uh, prices going down without Chinese production and, chi and prices going down with Chinese production is that pr uh, until the Chinese came in, the prices were going down based on enhanced and improved efficiency in production and, and enhanced product. With China, they're going down because of the subsidies. Now, once China, uh, once, and, and the Chinese managements, incidentally, have, have come out and said this, the, the CEO of Ying Li, for instance, said, uh, I think in late tw uh, 2012, that as soon as other, uh, other nations' solar, power, uh, solar producers have been reined in and pushed out of, uh, out, of, out of the industry, they are going to start raising prices. They cannot afford this kind of price, uh, price level in the future. So what do you want? You want your prices going down maybe a little bit slower through, uh, through improved technology, enhanced technology, or do you want uh, your prices uh, being cheap for a little while and then all of a sudden zooming up, skyrocketing? So the problem is uh, twofold then. Um, there is a time, time span, you said it will take so much time even without the Chinese solar panels mm -hmm. until the solar panels are here yeah. developed with a higher technology. That's true. Uh, if you, one of the, the interesting things that has just recently happened uh, is uh, a major U.S. utility has purchased uh, the, uh, has signed a contract to purchase solar energy from Mexico at prices actually lower than uh, what, would, uh, what it would cost for a coal-fired or a, a natural gas-based plant. Mm -hmm. So e that this, these aren't Chinese, this isn't Chinese production, and yet uh, it is, uh, it's the first contract signed which would have solar energy produced uh, and this is without Chinese subsidies, but solar energy produced at a competitive rate with the other, uh, the other fuels used in energy production. Mm -hmm. 
You were mentioning here also that um, we're not only talking about solar panels, we also talk about steel and paper and, and looking at the paper industry, it seems ridiculous that they're in it at all. <coughs> but what are the Chinese striving for? You say we can't understand China and the Chinese business models from economic point of view, right. but from political point of view. But what are, are they striving for? Is it some sort of world mon monopoly in the long, long term? Well, this is... Okay, the, the, the thing about uh, e Western economics and economic theory is that basically it takes the position that companies are out to make a profit. And Chinese companies are not out to make a profit. Their, their managements are not rewarded for profitability of the company. They're rewarded for total revenues and job creation. And so uh, if they're going to have or get to maximize their rewards for their managements, they're going to basically use low prices, establish technology, drive out competitors to enhance their, their total sales and revenue, and um, uh, then that would lead to job creation domestically, and it would lead to, um, to uh, maximum market share worldwide. Now, with the paper industry, wh one issue about the paper industry and about China is that if you look at China, yes, it, it has had tremendous economic growth. However, if you look at the, the, uh, the place of growth, geographically speaking, all that growth and, uh, and the increased income has happened on, along the coastal cities. If you look at the interior provinces up and, uh, and, and you track their growth, under the original reforms introduced by Deng in, in the 1980s, you had a tremendous economic growth and a growth of personal per capita wealth throughout China. That's the interior provinces and the coastal provinces. But then starting under President Jiang in the 90s, um, you had a, a, a change in policy, one that uh, focused on urbanization of the coastal cities. And uh, the interior provinces were then taxed very heavily in order to subsidize the urbanization policies. And what you find is that starting in the 1990s, yes, there has been economic growth. Yes, overall Chinese per capita income is rising. <coughs> but if you look at the provincial uh, data, uh, the interior provinces actually are getting poorer on a per capita basis. Their income is dropping. But that doesn't sound really like a success story or a long-term strategy that would be it's sustainable. Not it is not a success <coughs> story, and it's not sustainable. And what you find in the, in the last couple years and especially with uh, the, the policy pronouncements of uh, uh, the, the, incoming, the incoming leadership, uh, you find that they're saying that we need to build in growth in the interior. Well, one thing about the paper industry is that m a lot of the paper production and a lot of the subsidies are going to the interior provinces. And so it's providing employment in the interior provinces. So that's one reason why they focused on the paper industry, which doesn't really, if you look at it, doesn't really provide very much of a, of a strategic advantage in any which way that you can look at it. But it does create employment in the interior provinces. And that's one reason for subsidizing it and building it. And then I got doesn't just have a natural competitive advantage in any of these industries, no. not in steel, not in auto parts. They just, but, but Deng Xiaoping said, every single major country has an auto industry. China must have one. Yep. That's <coughs> it. So it has one, a major auto, in the, it's a major market, and auto parts are 70% of the cost of those autos. <coughs> China is a, is a, is a state-led system, and that is something that our economic theories cannot really handle. I mean, when they were not developed to understand a system like this. Yes, there have been others, smaller than China, but size matters in economics. And Chinese, the, the size of these industries, the growth of these industries, and the rate of change is just astounding. So that, that the economic theories have failed mm. to really understand or to, or to provide mm. any illumination on these things. Mm. OK, I say thank you so much, uh, this far, Hasha and George. I'm going to let the commentators in. Um, and first, I would like to introduce you, Mr. Yuan Nobei, who is a well-known person in the public debate, and he is also the author of several highly commended books and articles. I think the last one was about the Rain Revolution, wasn't it? That's right. 
That's right. <coughs> and now let's see what you're going to have to tell us about the Chinese situation. Thank you very much. Thanks for the invitation and thank you for your hard work and for this presentation. I must first of all commend you on your hard work and in incredibly labor-intensive work <laughs> that it must have been to collect all this data and try to make sense of it. We'll be the boring people. We don't <laughs> have <time. laughs> I think I'm on record saying that uh, it's impossible to make any sense of the Chinese subsidy system and it's too little transparency. We will never understand how it works and I'm glad to be have been proven half wrong, at least, <laughs> by, by this very important work. So I commend you on that. I would like to uh, present two comments, two points here. One which I think is complementary to what you have done about the history of China's success, and one that might be a bit more contradictory about who is really the victim of these subsidies and who is actually benefiting from these subsidies. First of all, the one where I think uh, where I, I, I think it's important to present a complementary and longer-term perspective on China's success story, because it is really a success story. They have been more successful than any other society in world history in reducing poverty, and it's important for us to find out why and understand why this happened. And I think, therefore, it's. And it's important to get this story straight because the Communist Party in China is really interested in promulgating a very state-centered account of the history of reform as designer, as instigator of these reforms, that it was somehow planned all the way through. And I think that this later story about the, the increase in subsidies and state-owned enterprises and so on uh, could be used to create that narrative, even though I don't think you really present it that way. You're writing about the earlier, more market-based uh, uh, situation. But I would then recommend, after you've read this book, and I really think that you should, you should read another current book uh, by Nobel laureate Roland, Ronald Coase and Ning Wang, called How China Became Capitalist, where they present the history as something that happened almost by accident, something that was not initiated by Beijing, but only got later on a stamp of approval from Beijing. They write about four different marginal revolutions in, in China, the Chinese economy. First of all, how the farmers sometimes secretly began to divide the plots and privatize land and create individual initiative produ to produce more, something that was illegal and they had to do it in secret late in the 1970s. And when that happened, China actually, without any subsidies in this sector, without any official stamp of approval, they went from being an importer of food to becoming an exporter just five to seven years later. The second marginal revolution, how this created more of a labor supply to township and village enterprises that operated entirely outside of the plan. They did not have access to raw materials at controlled prices. They did not have access to the state-controlled distribution system. Instead, they had to uh, hire their own sales teams and actually travel around China to find people who wanted to buy their goods. Third, we, after the Cultural Revolution, a lot of people, uh, millions of young people, uh, returned to the cities. They were restless. They were unemployed. They were fighting to try, and they were demonstrating and protesting in the 70s, in the 80s, because they wanted the right to open shops and small businesses like that. And through that grassroots uh, protest, the Communist Party felt that they had to open up in the cities as well. And the fourth marginal revolution is the special economic zones. And they were more instigated by the Communist Party because they realized that we need some sort of capitalist experiments. We don't want to abolish the planned economy, but let them in some enclaves, in some cities, try to experiment private businesses and some state-owned businesses with new business ideas, with exports and imports, with less regulation and so on. And what happened was that these small-scale enterprises and these special economic zones, they began to outperform the state-owned enterprises in a short time, in a short time period. And then Beijing put its stamp on approval of approval on these changes, and then the state-owned enterprises began to imitate what had already been done via these grassroots initiatives. So almost a story of accidents that were quite unintentional and 
really not that popular in the Communist Party, uh, really change China into a more capitalist society. And then, later on, these state-owned enterprises, at an accelerating pace that you're uh, writing about, was heavily subsidized as well. And that's the second part of the story. But I think we need that history as well to understand how China could change at that pace. So that's the complementary story. What I think might be a bit more contradictory is the story about who is really the victim of these subsidies. Because in my understanding of the issues, I think it's fair to say that it's not us. I think that definitely we'll see a lot of pain, a lot of industries, a lot of workers who suffer from these subsidized exports from, from China. But cheaper alternatives and cheaper competitors always wreak havoc with the industries that we already have here. And in a way, if that's unfair, and we can say that it's unfair, it's not playing by the same rule, but if it's unfair by the same rules, but if it's unfair, I think we'll have to cry all the way to the bank about it. Because what's really going on here is that the Chinese people, the Chinese businesses, the Chinese government is subsidizing our consumption. They are subsidizing our economies and makes it possible for us to devote less resources, less capital, less workers to what we need. And then instead we can put them to use in other, in other uh, spheres of the economy. As, and again, a lot of producers are being hurt by this. But as Adam Smith pointed out, consumption is the sole end and purpose of all production. And the interest of the producer ought to be attended to only so far as it may be necessary for promoting that of the consumer. And I think that if China found a way to supply us with cheap, reliable solar panels for all eternity, well, even without a cost at all to us, we should be the first to welcome it. The Chinese should be complaining about it. Because what's going on here is that the Chinese savers and the Chinese consumers and the potential Chinese, new Chinese businesses, they are more hurt by this. Because subsidies work <coughs> if there's a market failure, if there are potential positive external uh, benefits to society and to the economy that are not taken care of by private investors. And we have a government that sees this and knows how to support this. And the first thing might be correct. There are a lot of potentials that are not being taken care of. But very rarely in the history of mankind have we seen governments, Chinese communists or Swedish politicians or EU bureaucrats, understanding where that is and how to deal with it. The economist Josh Lerner famously sat down to write a book on what governments could do to promote better and more efficient and more productive businesses in the future. And he ended up calling it Boulevard of Broken Dreams because he understood that this very rarely happened. Because often governments pick losers rather than winners. They don't find the neglected opportunities. They jump onto the bandwagon, on the trends, the, what's already popular. Uh, case in point, how they subsidized all the internet and ICT companies in 1999 and 2000, when you could be a dog with a website and be drowned in venture capital. And then they didn't have any resources later on, and then everybody wanted to jump on the biotechnology bandwagon. I think that 49 of the 50 American states have a lot of funds to create bioclusters so that all the biotech companies end up in their state and not in the other, in the other states. We've seen it uh, all over, over the world. Um, they subsidize what wins them rather votes and grant projects rather than other things. I think that China is an illustration of this as well. They take money from the savers and from the consumers, which have stifled the internal domestic market that they need. And so they're more dependent on the exports industry than they should be. This has not created national champions, high-tech champions. They wanted to create that. They were supposed to control the car market, the automotive industry by now. But they're not. They have to buy the Swedish car companies to get that technology. They were supposed to have defeated the iPhones, the Ericsons, and so on, with their handhelds. But do you remember the Panda phone, the Kenka phone, the Ningbo Bird, and all those companies? I really don't, because that's not what happened with these subsidies. The subsidies created lazy and inefficient, inefficient giants that are destroying capital in China. They can produce a lot of activity, but that is oversupply of fairly unsophisticated products. And this is then my, my last point. 
they've created a lot of oversupply in these sectors. And I don't think this is part of a brilliant, smart, cunning plan, a five-year or 50-year plan on taking over the world. <coughs> I think they suffer from the same kind of political incentives that our politicians and the EU bureaucrats do. I think it's chaos over there. Local politicians, local communists who want to further their own political car career by creating these lo local projects and by creating <laughs> jobs locally. And that's why it's so difficult to make sense of this. this. I don't think that the Beijing really knows what's going on. I wouldn't be surprised if they are reading your book right now to find out what's going on in China <coughs> when it comes well. to these <laughs> subsidies. And I think that this results in a huge bubble of overinvestments. We can see this with Suntech. We can see it in cement. We can see it in aluminium. We can see it in steel. They're producing too much, not for the market, but for others. We can see studies showing that new innovative companies are more productive in China but they fail because they are defeated by the giants that do not further more value. Do you get a chance to and respond therefore, to yeah, Oh, absolutely, you will. So, so just the last <laughs> quote on this, and don't take my word for it, because this is what an insightful insider said a couple of years ago. The Chinese economy, due to these subsidies and to these overinvestments, is increasingly unstable, unbalanced, uncoordinated, and ultimately unsustainable. <coughs> and that was Wen Jiabao, the Chinese premier. Thank you. Thank you, Yuan. So what you, so what you, what you really are saying is that the real victims, those who suffer most, is the rural population in China. I think the rural population, the uh, consumers and the savers that yes. are forced to put their money into government-controlled banks that put them to use at their cousins and their second cousins local steel manufacturer rather than us. Yes. I think I'm going to let that commentators first and then we'll take a discussion. You can comment on all of them. Is okay. that okay? okay? Yeah, great. Because then I would like to ask uh, Mr. Christoph Fjellner to come up. Uh, we heard that the European Commission was imposing this kind of sanctions, uh, the anti anti-dumping levies of 11%. We heard also that Asha, Taylor, uh, Asha Haley here said that was much too low and 47% would also be too low. Uh, what's your comment on that? You've got your five minutes. I, I think they, they, uh, they announced that they could go all the way up to 68, I think, in the last <laughs> bill. But, but uh, first of all, I'd like to say I, I, I was just awarded the, <laughs> the challenge and the honor of, of being responsible in the European Parliament for the reform of the trade defense instruments in the European Union. And I'd just like to state and need to state that I will not here today speak in that capacity, and I will not speak on behalf of my fraction in the European Parliament. I will, though, try to make some brief comments and, and uh, share some thoughts on um, specifically the solar panels and then secondly on the policy options that the European uh, Union are choosing between to address this. Uh, first of all, it, it's a little bit awkward to, <laughs> to be on a discussion about subsidies to solar panels because I think in my political life I've mainly been criticized for not subsidizing solar panels enough. Uh, but, but now, maybe that's another part of, of, of subsidies, but still, it feels a little bit awkward. Uh, I must say, though, that the, the, the calculation that you presented is very impressive, and, and I, I hear much of the same message from the European Commission uh, when they presented the reasoning behind their, their uh, proposed, uh, introduced anti-dumping duties. Uh, I think, though, that it's important to, first of all, also, as, as many of you have, have already done, but I think it's important to differentiate between different producers, small, big, and because I've met a lot of Chinese producers that are squeezed <laughs> by these giants and actually suffer, and some of them might actually be the winners rather than the ones that actually are subsidized uh, to the extent uh, that you, you've given your examples. Uh, I think also that it's important to note that the debate around this, around solar panels in Europe, started off when Germany decided to start to roll back their subsidy scheme for solar panels, which led to a huge challenge for solar production in Germany. Uh, and that has also had other consequences, of course. Uh, not, not only that the, the Chinese export have, have been a challenge for producers, in Germany and the rollback of the subsidies. But we can also say, as, as I think you one pointed out as well, that we've, uh, due to the fact that we've had access to, to very cheap solar panels, we have had easier and cheaper m ways to meet our renewable energy targets in the European Union. And we also have quite a lot of studies right now that point at uh, 
the growth that those solar panels have actually led to in the supply chain. Because the, the big question here might not be the price of the import, but the value added. Where is the value added yeah. created? Is it created in the solar panel or the actually uh, the uh, mounting of the solar panel and, and a lot of other services connected to that? And where does that investment and that growth actually occur? And to some extent, we can see that it's, it's actually been quite beneficial to the European Union, which means that we've had a huge debate on this. Interestingly enough, the biggest producer of solar panels in Europe, and I think the second biggest, I'm not sure, in the world right now is Germany. <laughs> but the German government has decided they don't support any measures against solar panels. Even the German industry, BDI, Industry Association, have declared that they don't want any measures on solar panels. And the interesting question I ask myself is why? <laughs> Uh, uh, there might be different reasons. One of them might be the question about value added and what does this mean to the economy uh, in general. Uh, another reason that the Commission would like to point that is that they might not dare to complain about this. That the Chinese might be too big and they don't want to create a, a trade conflict that might cost them somewhere else. Uh, interestingly enough, that same argument is right now being raised in the next big fight that it will take place in this area, and that will be in telecom, where the Commission announced that they, will have s they are looking into starting an investigation on anti-dumping duties on telecom equipment, uh, directly m pointing at Huawei, Huawei. Uh, which, interestingly enough, none of the European producers of telecom equipment want. Uh, and, and I, I think it reminds me, well, it wasn't Ronald Reagan who said some, at some point that the, w the most scary thing you can hear is when, uh, some, uh, when the federal government comes and says, I'm here to help you. <laughs> and, and maybe that's, I don't know, but maybe that's what I'll meet Ericsson actually directly after this. I, I, maybe that will be the message that they will, uh, will portray. But, but I think that, interesting, why has Germany decided to do this? I think there might be a third option. Now I'd like to come back to that because I think they might have an either idea and another strategy rather than, than anti-dumping duties. Because anti-dumping duties, trade defense instrument, is the main tool, policy tool, that we use and that the WTO has said is, is the way to address these kind of problems. It's not new, it's in the WTO framework and being used. China has not market economy status in the European Union, which means that the way of actually addressing and defining whether dumping occurs is rather dubious, I would argue. First of all, the definition of dumping here is to sell a product cheaper on your export market than you do on your own market. It's worth to note that that is not illegal inside the European Union. <laughs> I would say it's quite common that Swedish companies sell their product a lot cheaper on their export mar markets rather than on the Swedish markets. But the reason that they, uh, the fact that they're not an, a market economy status also means that the Commission don't, they, they don't do the enormous work you do in defining the subsidies and therefore defining the, the dumping margin and how much, how, how big is this dumping. The way they do it in the European Union and many countries is that you use an analog country. Yeah. You simply look at another country and see what is the price of solar panel in another country. And the difference between them is, of course, then the dumping margin. Normally, it's secret what analog country is. I think it's quite commonly known that in the case of solar panels, it was India. And therefore, the margin became very high. I wouldn't say that's a necessarily sophisticated way of defining the, because there might be other ra natural reasons why there's a big difference between prices in India and, and, and in, in China. Uh, last but not least, I think that it's also interesting to see, because this is, some people would argue that you could address this with competition policy instead. And normally in the European Union, and in many, countries you address these questions with competition policy. But in competition policy, to actually start something, it has to be a dominant actor one way or another. Normally in anti-dumping duties, you actually go for the newcomers because the, the, the incumbents are normally the ones that file the complaints. Let me then end by just saying that Germany, I, I, I said that Germany might have another strategy. Interestingly enough, the German Chancellor have repeatedly said, and now the Commission when it comes to telecom says, we don't actually want to introduce duties. We'd rather negotiate with the Chinese. When I hear that, then I'm getting nervous. 
if the biggest and the second biggest producer of solar panels says that they're going to negotiate to find a solution, <laughs> then I think about Adam Smith. And therefore, I don't, I think that option might even be worse <laughs> and go back to the managed trade that we managed to get rid of in the Uruguay round. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Christopher Fjellen. <laughs> <coughs> and then we got our third, um, sorry. <coughs> and then we got a third commentator. His name is Mr. Carl Haldi, and he is head of the China program at Stockholm Environment Institute, and he is also the former advisor on climate issues at the Swedish Embassy in Beijing. So please tell us what are your reflections on this book. <coughs> thanks a lot. Uh, it's great to be here, and, and uh, thanks a lot uh, for a, a book that added a lot of, of insights, I think, that uh, put also numbers to things that I have been observing through having worked with China for actually this, au this autumn for 30 years. Uh, most of the time spent on, on following China's environmental development, but environment and development, I, I would say. Um, now, a, a lot of what I had planned to say say here is, has already been said. Uh, so let me pick up on a few things. First of all, uh, this, the, the solar panel issue uh, from a point of view of the, of the debate here in, in Europe, uh, the different in arguments whether it's good or bad that we could buy cheap Chinese solar panels. So there, there is one camp that has the classic position that if the Chinese want to <coughs> subsidize something we could buy it cheaper, great. Why complain about that? Why at all raise the fuss? I think your book is giving a lot of argument why we need to make a fuss about that. Uh, a, a, a variant of that position is, is uh, people who claim that um, the cheap Chinese solar panels means the possibility for us in Europe to make a great leap. There's a threshold somewhere, and now we reach that threshold, so we could, we could put solar panels on all our ro roofs and it, it would pay off. And that is a game changer. So the cheap prices is good for that change to happen. But um, as you've shown in your book, and which is something that I, I've, I've, I've seen um, so to say on the ground since many years, um, the Chinese producers are not particularly in, in the <coughs> forefront of, of, of new advanced technologies. They're just taking existing technologies and maybe they're advancing the uh, production um, technologies of, of those, and they have a large production units that keep, could keep down prices, and they have other favorable conditions in terms of loans and, and cheap energy and cheap labor and so on. Um, so there is, it's not a level playing field. And that is, of course, a problem for us all. If the best producers, the ones that hold the opportunity to find the, the brilliant solutions that get more energy out of the sun to even cheaper price in the future, if they are kicked out of the market, if they cannot capitalize in the same way because there is no level playing field, then we're all losers. So I think th and these, these are the arguments, but uh, um, I tend to hear much more of the argument that let us be happy for the Chinese subsidizing and you know, that's good for us. Let's use the opportunity. Uh, to what extent the, 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 uh, the tariffs here will, will help to solve the problem, I can't tell. I, but I, I do think that we need to be much more um, less um, uh, naive about our interactions uh, with, with China. Now, I'll leave the solar panels. Uh, I would like to, to go back and pick up on what you talked about here, uh, Johan, the, the narratives and whose narrative, and also m maybe um, uh, complement your picture or, or maybe even challenging it. Because uh, you, you make a case here of the one big state uh, monolith that is running the whole society. And uh, I think th the narrative of how this all happened um, how the Chinese miraculous development took place is not one of that was planned from the very beginning. I, I, I very much agree to what you once said here. It is a, a matter of um, the, the state taking its, its heavy hand off and, 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 and thrift from people um, 
driving a, a miraculous development and the, the many aspects of how that opened up in the in the 80s and, and continued through the, through the 90s and, and sped up uh, in, 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 in the 2000s. And, and the narrative is important to understand, also to understand the subsidies. Uh, in certain areas like, uh, like uh, coal uh, production and so on, China actually worked very hard at taking away subsidies in the 80s and 90s. Uh, then the subsidies came back again here in, in, in the 2000s. And so why that happened? You, 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 you tell the story around that, which is very interesting. But I, if you go five years back, you, the, um, Dan Rosen and Trevor Hauser of Peterson Institute wrote a very interesting book called China's Energy, A Guide for the Perplexed. And at, at, at that time, uh, they, they explained uh, many of the things that you also, also explained. But this was before they actually exported a lot of, of, uh, of steel. So they actually explained the steel export as something happening when domestic demand did not pick up the domestic supply. And the supply side had grown not because the state had ordered it, because, but because every local um, community, from, 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 from pro provincial governments to even cities, wanted to have their own producer. So that also explains, the, as, as you point out in the book, the, the, the Chinese heavy industry is not very well coordinated. It's really f f fractioned and not particularly efficient at all. It's, it's grown out of, of competition between provincial levels or city level actors, sometimes against the will of the central government. So there's a much more difficult um, uh, archipelago to understand on, on, on the different actors in, in China. But I, I, I think it, it's safe to say that the drive for growth in heavy industry in China from late 1990s uh, and in, in, into the 2000s, it originally driven by actually demand, infrastructure demand in China. Originally, most of what was produced was consumed in China. It's not until 2004, 5, 6, it starts to be overproduction. And that's also the same time when the huge subsidies comes into the system. And, and, and that is the story we need to, to concentrate on here. Why is that happening? Who is driving that? and um, what will be the consequences in, in, in the long run. Uh, from an environmental point of view, to round off here, uh, and of course, the losers are the people in China. Uh, not only because it's their savings that goes into this non -very, not very productive type of industry, but also there are the side effects, like extreme, extreme pollution. And this is at the level of pollution we can't even imagine. It's the level where you could now go out and, 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 and look at, at peer-reviewed articles stating that uh, you have severe health effects, severe problems in terms of um, disability at birth of kids, for example, going up rapidly. If you talk to people in China today who are better educated, they try to leave. They try to move somewhere else because of these side effects of the subsidies of the heavy industries in terms of environmental problems. So it's both a problem of, of air and water quality, it's also a problem of supply of water and energy. Now, China's idea of, of, of moving on is to move towards more value-added production. And I don't see that going to happen if you can't recruit the brains to go to China to sit there and think out the new uh, big and uh, the, the, the new uh, um, transforming type of technologies. And as we have said here today, that we don't see that really happening in China. So Thanks. it's not a sustainable model? No. No. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you so much, Carl Halding.